I'm Chris Seeley. I'm an associate professor in philosophy. Um, currently, I'm at Fairfield University in Fairfield, Connecticut. I've been there since 2006. Um, it's my first teaching position out of grad school. Um, and so, so far it's been, it's been really great. Um, uh, so at Fairfield, I teach courses in existentialism, social and political philosophy and critical race theory. And I also do, um, you know, general intro to philosophy courses. Um, I, uh, my research, um, has involved up until now, it's been in, um, in uh, Levinas scholarship, Sartre scholarship, um, and French continental philosophy in general. Um, I received tenure in 2013, and so since 2013, um, I'm on this uh, journey, if you will, of sort of reinventing the kind of scholar I am, taking the time to just read and, um, you know, uh, really strengthen my scholarship in post-colonial theory and critical race theory. So that's where um, my intellectual headspace is at the moment. Right. So, um, so on the question of feminism and how it relates to me, I guess, personally and then professionally, um, so I'll start with the personal first. Um, <clears throat> um, I mean, I I grew up in a family that, um, you know, thankfully did not make me, didn't give me the impression that there were any restrictions on how big I can dream or how far I can go, um, given that I, <clears throat> you know, was a girl. Um, and I, so I think that was my first sort of implicit encounter with feminism. Um, and so, you know, um, you know, this notion of, of being in a world where, you know, uh, women and young girls can strive for as much as they desire and reach as high as they desire was pretty normal and normalized for me. Um, and I think that's why, um, at least up until this point, um, feminist issues and feminist questions haven't made it explicitly into my scholarship and my professional life. Um, but it does influence or at least inform uh, how I teach, how I interact with my students, and how I interact with my colleagues. Um, and so <clears throat> um, I guess I guess I'll use um, a very interesting sort of uh, quirky thing that I saw, uh, you know, floating around social media fairly recently. And it was the, <laughs> this idea that, um, uh, so whenever a woman, um, engages with the world and acts in a way to, um, counter the assumption that she's a doorstop, that for me is what feminism is. So, um, so in my interaction with students, um, you know, I make it a point of duty to to let my 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 woman students, particularly my woman students of color, um, know and understand that that is the kind of space that they're in when they're in my classroom, when they're in my office hours, um, you know, or maybe more sort of more unofficial, non-professional settings. Um, if I have opportunities to mentor students or partner with students in any sort of scholarship scholarship or intellectual project. Um, my first choice is always to find um, a, a, a woman of color um, who might be interested in working with me. Um, that, that I think has been my way of contributing to the sort of feminist, the black feminist enterprise. So my, um, my dissertation was on, um, you know, these two figures, um, Emmanuel Levinas and Jean Paul Sartre. And I came to them um, in grad school <coughs> because I was interested in phenomenology um, and what it meant to, to use that methodology to ask philosophical questions. Um, and as I got into writing the dissertation and definitely at the end of the dissertation, um, at which time I was, I was already at Fairfield, 
um, <clears throat> my interest in Levinas and Sartre was around this question of what it what it meant to to be disrupted or what it meant to be a human being and have that structure of disruption at the center of your being, um, what it meant to feel um, sort of cold or pulled outside of yourself, um, what it meant to uh, feel related in this sort of compulsory and obligatory way to other people. Um, and so that was the question that really guided the converting the dissertation into the book on, on Levinas and Sartre. And so now <clears throat> that I'm really transitioning into, um, you know, quite post-colonial questions or, or questions pertaining to race and philosophy of race, um, that transition is really being guided by this question of, of disruption and interruption and what it means to live in a world really opened up or being opened onto other people and, and their suffering, um, what it means to be in solidarity with someone um, across gender lines, across racial lines, um, across uh, commonalities in immigration experiences. So um, I wrote this one article, and this is coming close to the end of the book project, using um, this using a Levinasian notion of identity to ask this question about uh, black solidarity. And so I really see that article as the sort of explicit transition point for me um, out of, you know, really hardcore Levinas scholarship into questions um, about critical race theory. So the name of the book that um, that came out in 2013, December 2013, is uh, Moments of Disruption, uh, Levinas, Sartre, and the Question of Transcendence. And it really is um, an exploration of this, this um, the meaning of transcendence as it shows up um, or plays out, I guess, in Levinas's um, account of human identity and Sartre's account of human identity. So it's, it's, it's mostly theoretical, this pursuit of the meaning of transcendence and the implication of transcendence. Um, but at base, it also has these sort of political and ethical implications um, because I locate this question of transcendence as really a question of what it means to be a human being and what it means to understand ourselves as, as free and responsible at the same time. Um, what it means to, um, you know, to, to exist in one space as a sort of triumphant author of one's life, as opposed to um, being moved through and moved along by how and why we feel obligated um, to, to say something or to act on behalf of someone else's suffering. So I, I, in the final chapter, I bring those questions to bear on how transcendence plays out in Levinas and Sartre, respectively. And I try to show that, you know, ultimately they don't vary as much as, um, as much as the literature would have them, um, or as much as the literature would sort of juxtaposition themselves, them against each other. So these two terms, transcendence as intentionality versus transcendence as ex as extendence, um, these are really two terms that I came up with to try to keep clear and separate um, my reading of Levinas as opposed to my reading my reading of Levinas as opposed to my reading of Sartre. So, <clears throat> so with transcendence as intentionality, um, that phrase. Is I use that phrase as an attempt to, to capture the sort of nutshell of Sartre's position, which is that um, the movement of transcendence, the sort of surpassing of myself and my being and my position in existence, happens in a project of intentionality, which is to say, when I project, uh, when I pursue what I want for myself, when I pursue the kind of world that I want to create for myself, when I pursue the version of myself that I want to be, um, I project certain 
um, choices and desires um, that that are genuinely of me. And in that projection, I quite literally sort of step outside of myself and exist ahead of myself. Um, <clears throat> and that facade is the structure of transcendence. Um, that's sort of, and it's a structure that's grounded in, in you know, autonomy and creativity and authorship. And now for Levinas, um, who also wants to gesture towards a kind of surpassing, transcending um, uh, movement, he wants to say that, well, yes, that's possible. But for Levinas, um, that doesn't happen through authorship and sovereignty and creating a world for myself. For Levinas, transcendence happens through the ways in which the face of the other literally pulls me outside of myself or or you might want to say the ways in which the face of the other um um requires me to to die to myself to what i want and what I'm, uh, and what i desire for myself and instead attend to um what the, the needs that that face has or, or um even the desire that that face has um and so this phrase "excendence" is um, is a word that Levinas uses in his earlier work. So Levinas doesn't mention transcendence in his earlier writings. It's all about excendence, um, and the X of the excendence is meant to convey a kind of exiting, uh, what he would what he would term a genuine exiting, as opposed to the Sartrean intentionality of like sort of spitting out a version of the world that I want. Um, Levinas doesn't want, he wants to say that that's a sort of disingenuous um, version of transcendence. So the transcendence as extendence is meant to capture that more Levinasian account. So the actual title of the book, The Moments of, Moments of Disruption, um, is meant to, um, to capture this one underlying thread or theme that I identify at the descriptive level in Levinas and Sartre. And so, you know, as, a, as, a, as I worked on that book, what I discovered is um, these accounts of human existence, again, very sort of everyday mundane experiences that, that really conveyed the individual, the individual person, not as as whole and collected and with herself, but quite frankly, as like split and open and disrupted and interrupted um, from the outside. And so I use that, you know, I decided to use that as a title of the book, Moments of Disruption, um, because that's really what I wanted the book to highlight in Levinas and Sartre um, to then make sense of the claim that it's on these, it's around these moments of disruption that they should be brought together, right? So moments of this, moments of disruption, meaning um, a re-envisioning, a re-envisioning of what it means to be a human being, that to be a human being is to be disrupted, to be a human being is to be um, not wrapped up in this sort of intentional making of a world for myself, but to be constantly interrupted in that project or to have that project constantly interrupted by things and factors that I have no control over. Um, so what I wanted, I guess, readers of the book to take away ultimately, I mean, this is a question that um, I guess I was too buried in the book to really to really focus on until at the very end. Um, but I'm glad I did because um, ultimately I would like for this book to be the kind of book that, that can start a conversation about how we think of ourselves as people in relationship to other people. Um, and so to think of, so, so when I think of myself not as this, you know, very neat collected individual, but instead uh, uh, an entity or an existence that's open and and disrupted and interrupted, then I'm also forced to rethink 
um, rethink the implications of my free and creative projects, right? It, it, so, so to think of myself as interrupted and disrupted then forces me to hold myself accountable, I think, in ways that um, the absence of that question would not allow me to, 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 to pay attention to. And so, you know, at the end, I would like the takeaway of the book to be, um, you, you know, how the ways in which we might live better lives as individuals and then live better lives as communities of individuals if we, um, if, if we prioritize this, this picture of ourselves as disrupted or interrupted as opposed to whole and insular and, and, you know, completely separate from that which is other than ourselves. So my advice, I, which is which is weird because I feel like I was just getting advice from other people, but I mean, I guess what I would like to share from my own experience um, to you know, a woman of color in philosophy in graduate school, um, you know, maybe maybe pretty close to writing the dissertation, um, is one when you do come into that dissertation project to sort of be mindful that. Um, really and truly, you will be connected to that question and to that topic for a really, really long time. So, you know, you, you write the dissertation, you, you um, get on the job market, you get your first tenure track job or what have you. Um, that dissertation project, uh, you will be expected to, to mine that dissertation project, you know, for things like articles and ultimately possibly a book. And so, you know, when you are trying to determine what it is you want to write about, be sure that it's something that you have the fuel and energy to be committed to for a relatively long period of time. Um, um, and that's just the sort of practicality of sort of going through <clears throat> the stages of the academic process. Um, and I guess on a more principled note, um, my my advice would be to um, to really to, to when that when if when that time comes where you have um, I guess the 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 time and the resources and the luxury to to write for the sake of of the love of writing or to pursue scholarship for the sake of the love of pursuing scholarship. Um, to really appreciate that time um, and, and to, to, you know, give yourself permission to become a student in the genuine sense um, and to, to read things and, and try scholarship that you, gener you genuinely want to pursue and you find interesting and not necessarily because um, it's what's expected of you as a woman of color. Um, I think that's that's really important, and and that's been my trajectory, um, and I think that's been good for me in in a number of ways, both both practically and professionally, um, and principally as well. I feel more whole and more authentic um, as as an academic and and as a scholar, generally speaking.